The Painted Veil, Somerset Maugham, Part 3, 31. It was a bungalow, and she entered the sitting room. She sat down while the coolies, straggling in one by one, brought in their loads. Walter in the courtyard gave directions where this or that was to be placed. She was very tired. She was startled to hear an unknown voice. May I come in? She flushed and grew pale. She was overwrought, and it made her nervous to meet a stranger. A man came out of the darkness, for the long, low room was lit only by a shaded lamp, and held out his hand. My name is Waddington. I am the Deputy Commissioner. Oh, the customs, I know. I heard that you were here. In that dim light, she could see only that he was a little thin man, no taller than she, with a bald head and a small, bare face. I live just at the bottom of the hill, but coming in this way, you wouldn't have seen my house. I thought you'd be too fagged to come and dine with me, so I've ordered your dinner here, and I've invited myself. I'm delighted to hear it. You'll find the cook's not bad. I kept on Watson's boys for you. Watson was the missionary who was here? Yes, very nice fellow. I'll show you his grave tomorrow, if you like. How kind you are, said Kitty with a smile. At that moment, Walter came in. Waddington had introduced himself to him before coming in to see Kitty, and now he said, I've just been breaking it to your missus that I'm dining with you. Since Watson died, I haven't had anybody much to talk to but the nuns, and I can never do myself justice in French. Besides, there is only a limited number of subjects you can talk to them about. I've just told the boy to bring in some drinks, said Walter. The servant brought whiskey and soda, and Kitty noticed that Waddington helped himself generously. His manner of speaking and his easy chuckle had suggested to her, when he came in, that he was not quite sober. Here's luck, he said. Then, turning to Walter, You've got your work cut out for you here. They're dying like flies. The magistrate's lost his head, and Colonel Yu, the officer commanding the troops, is having a devil of a job to prevent them from looting. If something doesn't happen soon, we shall all be murdered in our beds. I tried to get the nuns to go, but of course they wouldn't. They all want to be martyrs. Damn them. He spoke lightly, and there was in his voice a sort of ghostly laughter so that you could not listen to him without smiling. Why haven't you gone? asked Walter. Well, I've lost half my staff and the others are ready to lie down and die at any minute. Somebody's got to stay and keep things together. Have you been inoculated? Yes, Watson did me. But he did himself too, and it didn't do him much good, poor blighter. He turned to Kitty, and his funny little face was gaily puckered. I don't think there's any great risk if you take proper precautions. Have your milk and water boiled, and don't eat fresh fruit or uncooked vegetables. Have you brought any gramophone records with you? No, I don't think so, said Kitty. I'm sorry for that, I was hoping you would. I haven't had any for a long time and I'm sick of my old ones. The boy came in to ask if they would have dinner. You won't dress tonight, will you? asked Waddington. My boy died last week, and the boy I have now is a fool, so I haven't been dressing in the evening. I'll go and take off my hat, said Kitty. Her room was next door to that in which they sat. It was barely furnished. An Amar was kneeling on the floor, the lamp beside her, unpacking Kitty's things. 32. The dining room was small, and the greater part of it was filled by an immense table. On the walls were engravings of scenes from the Bible and illuminated texts. Missionaries always have large dining tables, Waddington explained. They get so much a year more for every child they have, and they buy their tables when they marry, so that there shall be plenty of room for little strangers. From the ceiling hung a large paraffin lamp, so that Kitty was able to see better what sort of a man Waddington was. His baldness had deceived her into thinking him no longer young, but she saw now that he must be well under forty. His face, small under a high, rounded forehead, was unlined and fresh-coloured, 
It was ugly like a monkey's, but with an ugliness that was not without charm. It was an amusing face. His features, his nose and his mouth were hardly larger than a child's, and he had small, very bright blue eyes. His eyebrows were fair and scanty. He looked like a funny little old boy. He helped himself constantly to liquor, and as dinner proceeded, it became evident that he was far from sober. But if he was drunk, it was without offensiveness, gaily, as a satyr might be who had stolen a wineskin from a sleeping shepherd. He talked of Ching Yen. He had many friends there, and he wanted to know about them. He had been down for the races a year before, and he talked of ponies and their owners. By the way, what about Townsend? he asked suddenly. Is he going to become colonial secretary? Kitty felt herself flush, but her husband did not look at her. I shouldn't wonder, he answered. He's the sort that gets on. Do you know him? asked Walter. Yes, I know him pretty well. We travelled out from home together once. From the other side of the river, they heard the beating of gongs and the clatter of firecrackers. There, so short away from them, the great city lay in terror, and death, sudden and ruthless, hurried through its tortuous streets. But Waddington began to speak of London. He talked of the theatres. He knew everything that was being played at the moment, and he told them what pieces he had seen when he was last home on leave. He laughed as he recollected the humour of this low comedian, and sighed as he reflected on the beauty of that star of musical comedy. He was pleased to be able to boast that a cousin of his had married one of the most celebrated. He had lunched with her, and she had given him her photograph. He would show it to them when they came and dined with him at the customs. Walter looked at his guest with a cold and ironic gaze, but he was evidently not a little amused by him, and he made an effort to show a civil interest in topics of which Kitty was well aware he knew nothing. A faint smile lingered on his lips, but Kitty, she knew not why, was filled with awe. In the house of that dead missionary, over against the stricken city, they seemed immeasurably apart from all the world. Three solitary creatures and strangers to each other. Dinner was finished, and she rose from the table. Do you mind if I say good night to you? I'm going to bed. I'll take myself off. I expect the doctor wants to go to bed too, answered Waddington. We must be out early tomorrow. He shook hands with Kitty. He was quite steady on his feet, but his eyes were shining more than ever. I'll come and fetch you, he told Walter, and take you to see the magistrate and Colonel Yu, and then we'll go along to the convent. You've got your work cut out, I can tell you. 33. Her night was tortured with strange dreams. She seemed to be carried in her chair, and she felt the swaying motion as the bearers marched with their long, uneven stride. She entered cities, vast and dim, where the multitude thronged about her with curious eyes. The streets were narrow and tortuous, and in the open shops, with their strange wares, all traffic stopped as she went by, and those who bought, and those who sold, paused. Then she came to the memorial arch, and its fantastic outline seemed on a sudden to gain a monstrous life. Its capricious contours were like the waving arms of a Hindu god, and as she passed under it, she heard the echo of mocking laughter. But then, Charlie Townsend came towards her and took her in his arms, lifting her out of the chair, and said it was all a mistake. He had never meant to treat her as he had, for he loved her, and he couldn't live without her. She felt his kisses on her mouth, and she wept with joy, asking him why he had been so cruel, but though she asked, she knew it did not matter. And then there was a hoarse, abrupt cry, and they were separated and between, hurrying silently, coolies passed in their ragged blue, and they bore a coffin. She awoke with a start. The bungalow stood halfway down a steep hill, and from her window she saw the narrow river below her and opposite, the city. The dawn had just broken, and from the river rose a white mist, 
shrouding the junks that lay moored close to one another like peas in a pod. There were hundreds of them, and they were silent, mysterious in that ghostly light, and you had a feeling that their crews lay under an enchantment, for it seemed that it was not sleep, but something strange and terrible that held them so still and mute. The morning drew on, and the sun touched the mist so that it shone whitely like the ghost of snow on a dying star. Though on the river it was light, so that you could discern palely the lines of the crowded junks and the thick forest of their masts, in front it was a shining wall the eye could not pierce. But suddenly, from that white cloud, a tall, grim, and massive bastion emerged. It seemed not merely to be made visible by the all-discovering sun, but rather to rise out of nothing at the touch of a magic wand. It towered, the stronghold of a cruel and barbaric race, over the river. But the magician who built worked swiftly, and now a fragment of coloured wall crowned the bastion. In a moment, out of the mist, looming vastly and touched here and there by a yellow ray of sun, there was seen a cluster of green and yellow roofs. Huge they seemed, and you could make out no pattern. The order, if order there was, escaped you. Wayward and extravagant, but of an unimaginable richness. This was no fortress nor a temple, but the magic palace of some emperor of the gods where no man might enter. It was too airy, fantastic and unsubstantial to be the work of human hands. It was the fabric of a dream. The tears ran down Kitty's face, and she gazed, her hands clasped to her breast and her mouth, for she was breathless, open a little. She had never felt so light of heart, and it seemed to her as though her body were a shell that lay at her feet, and she pure spirit. Here was beauty. She took it, as the believer takes in his mouth, the wafer, which is God. 34. Since Walter went out early in the morning, came back at Tiffin only for half an hour, and did not then return till dinner was just ready, Kitty found herself much alone. For some days she did not stir from the bungalow. It was very hot, and for the most part she lay in a long chair by the open window trying to read. The hard light of midday had robbed the magic palace of its mystery, and now it was no more than a temple on the city wall, garish and shabby, but because she had seen it once in such an ecstasy, it was never again quite commonplace. And often at dawn or at dusk and again at night, she found herself able to recapture something of that beauty. What had seemed to her a mighty bastion was but the city wall, and on this, massive and dark, her eyes rested continually. Behind its crenellations lay the city in the dread grip of the pestilence. Vaguely, she knew that terrible things were happening there, not from Walter who, when she questioned him, for otherwise he rarely spoke to her, answered with a humorous nonchalance which sent a shiver down her spine, but from Waddington and from the armour. The people were dying at the rate of a hundred a day, and hardly any of those who were attacked by the disease recovered from it. The gods had been brought out from the abandoned temples and placed in the streets. Offerings were laid before them and sacrifices made, but they did not stay the plague. The people died so fast that it was hardly possible to bury them. In some houses the whole family had been swept away, and there was none to perform the funeral rites. The officer commanding the troops was a masterful man, and if the city was not given over to riot and arson, it was due to his determination. He forced his soldiers to bury such as there was no one else to bury, and he had shot with his own hand an officer who demurred at entering a stricken house. Kitty sometimes was so frightened that her heart sank within her, and she would tremble in every limb. It was very well to say that the risk was small if you took reasonable precautions. She was panic-stricken. She turned over in her mind crazy plans of escape. To get away, just to get away, she was prepared to set out as she was and make her way alone, without anything but what she stood up in, to some place of safety. 
She thought of throwing herself on the mercy of Waddington, telling him everything and beseeching him to help her to get back to Ching Yen. If she flung herself on her knees before her husband and admitted that she was frightened, frightened, even though he hated her now, he must have enough human feeling in him to pity her. It was out of the question. If she went, where could she go? Not to her mother. Her mother would make her see very plainly that, having married her off, she counted on being rid of her, and besides, she did not want to go to her mother. She wanted to go to Charlie, and he did not want her. She knew what he would say if she suddenly appeared before him. She saw the sullen look of his face and the shrewd hardness behind his charming eyes. It would be difficult for him to find words that sounded well. She clenched her hands. She would have given anything to humiliate him as he had humiliated her. Sometimes she was seized with such a frenzy that she wished she had let Walter divorce her, ruining herself, if only she could have ruined him too. Certain things he had said to her made her blush with shame when she recalled them. 35. The first time she was alone with Waddington, she brought the conversation round to Charlie. Waddington had spoken of him on the evening of their arrival. She pretended that he was no more than an acquaintance of her husband. I never much cared for him, said Waddington. I've always thought him a bore. You must be very hard to please, returned Kitty, in the bright, chaffing way she could assume so easily. I suppose he's far and away the most popular man in Ching Yen. I know. That is his stock in trade. He's made a science of popularity. He has the gift of making everyone he meets feel that he is the one person in the world he wants to see. He's always ready to do a service that isn't any trouble to himself, and even if he doesn't do what you want, he manages to give you the impression that it's only because it's not humanly possible. That is surely an attractive trait. Charm and nothing but charm at last grows a little tiresome, I think. It's a relief, then, to deal with a man who isn't quite so delightful, but a little more sincere. I've known Charlie Townsend for a good many years, and once or twice I've caught him with the mask off. You see, I never mattered, just a subordinate official in the customs, and I know that he doesn't in his heart give a damn for anyone in the world but himself. Kitty, lounging easily in her chair, looked at him with smiling eyes. She turned her wedding ring round and round her finger. Of course he'll get on. He knows all the official ropes. Before I die, I have every belief that I shall address him as Your Excellency and stand up when he enters the room. Most people think he deserves to get on. He's generally supposed to have a great deal of ability. Ability? What nonsense! He's a very stupid man. He gives you the impression that he dashes off his work and gets it through from sheer brilliancy. Nothing of the kind. He's as industrious as a Eurasian clerk. How has he got the reputation of being so clever? There are many foolish people in the world, and when a man in a rather high position puts on no frills, slaps them on the back, and tells them he'll do anything in the world for them, they are very likely to think him clever. And then, of course, there's his wife. There's an able woman, if you like. She has a good sound head, and her advice is always worth taking. As long as Charlie Townsend's got her to depend on, he's pretty safe, never to do a foolish thing, and that's the first thing necessary for a man to get on in government service. They don't want clever men. Clever men have ideas, and ideas cause trouble. They want men who have charm and tact, and who can be counted on never to make a blunder. Oh, yes, Charlie Townsend will get to the top of the tree all right. I wonder why you dislike him. I don't dislike him. But you like his wife better? smiled Kitty. I'm an old-fashioned little man, and I like a well-bred woman. I wish she were well-dressed as well as well-bred. Doesn't she dress well? I never noticed. I've always heard that they were a devoted couple, said Kitty, watching him through her eyelashes. He's very fond of her. I will give him that credit. I think that is the most decent thing about him. Cold praise. He has his little flirtations, but they're not serious. He's much too cunning to let them go to such lengths 
as might cause him inconvenience. And of course he isn't a passionate man. He's only a vain one. He likes admiration. He's fat and forty now. He does himself too well. But he was very good-looking when he first came to the colony. I've often heard his wife chaff him about his conquests. She doesn't take his flirtations very seriously? Oh, no, she knows they don't go very far. She says she'd like to be able to make friends of the poor little things who fall to Charlie, but they're always so common. She says it's really not very flattering to her that the women who fall in love with her husband are so uncommonly second-rate. 36. When Waddington left her, Kitty thought over what he had so carelessly said. It hadn't been very pleasant to hear, and she had had to make something of an effort not to show how much it touched her. It was bitter to think that all he said was true. She knew that Charlie was stupid and vain, hungry for flattery, and she remembered the complacency with which he had told her little stories to prove his cleverness. He was proud of a low cunning. How worthless must she be if she had given her heart so passionately to such a man because, because he had nice eyes and a good figure. She wished to despise him, because so long as she only hated him, she knew that she was very near loving him. The way he had treated her should have opened her eyes. Walter had always held him in contempt. Oh, if she could only get him out of her mind altogether. And had his wife chaffed him about her obvious infatuation for him? Dorothy would have liked to make a friend of her, but that she found her second rate. Kitty smiled a little. How indignant her mother would be to know that her daughter was considered that. But at night she dreamt of him again. She felt his arms pressing her close and the hot passion of his kisses on her lips. What did it matter if he was fat and forty? She laughed with soft affection because he minded so much. She loved him all the more for his childlike vanity, and she could be sorry for him and comfort him. When she awoke, tears were streaming from her eyes. She did not know why it seemed to her so tragic to cry in her sleep. 37. She saw Waddington every day, for he strolled up the hill to the Fane's bungalow when his day's work was done. And so after a week, they had arrived at an intimacy which under other circumstances they could scarcely have achieved in a year. Once when Kitty told him she didn't know what she would do there without him, he answered, laughing, You see, you and I are the only people here who walk quite quietly and peaceably on solid ground. The nuns walk in heaven and your husband in darkness. Though she gave a careless laugh, she wondered what he meant. She felt that his merry little blue eyes were scanning her face with an amiable but disconcerting attention. She had discovered already that he was shrewd, and she had a feeling that the relations between herself and Walter excited his cynical curiosity. She found a certain amusement in baffling him. She liked him, and she knew that he was kindly disposed towards her. He was not witty nor brilliant, but he had a dry and incisive way of putting things which was diverting, and his funny boyish face under that bald skull, all screwed up with laughter, made his remarks sometimes extremely droll. He had lived for many years in outports, often with no man of his own colour to talk to, and his personality had developed in eccentric freedom. He was full of fads and oddities. His frankness was refreshing. He seemed to look upon life in a spirit of banter, and his ridicule of the colony at Ching Yen was acid. But he laughed also at the Chinese officials in Mei Tan Fu and at the cholera which decimated the city. He could not tell a tragic story or one of heroism without making it faintly absurd. He had many anecdotes of his adventures during twenty years in China, and you concluded from them that the earth was a very grotesque, bizarre, and ludicrous place. Though he denied that he was a Chinese scholar, he swore that the synologues were as mad as March hares, he spoke the language with ease. He read little, and what he knew he had learned from conversation. But he often told Kitty stories from the Chinese novels and from Chinese history, and though he told them with that airy badinage which was natural to him, it was good-humoured and even tender. 
It seemed to her that, perhaps unconsciously, he had adopted the Chinese view that the Europeans were barbarians and their life a folly. In China alone was it so led that a sensible man might discern in it a sort of reality. Here was food for reflection. Kitty had never heard the Chinese spoken of as anything but decadent, dirty, and unspeakable. It was as though the corner of a curtain were lifted for a moment, and she caught a glimpse of a world rich, with a colour and significance she had not dreamt of. He sat there, talking, laughing, and drinking. "'Don't you think you drink too much?' said Kitty to him boldly. "'It's my great pleasure in life,' he answered. "'Besides, it keeps the cholera out.' When he left her, he was generally drunk, but he carried his liquor well. It made him hilarious, but not disagreeable. One evening Walter, coming back earlier than usual, asked him to stay to dinner. A curious incident happened. They had their soup and their fish, and then with the chicken, a fresh green salad was handed to Kitty by the boy. "'Good God, you're not going to eat that!' cried Waddington, as he saw Kitty take some. "'Yes, we have it every night.' "'My wife likes it,' said Walter. The dish was handed to Waddington, but he shook his head. Thank you very much, but I'm not thinking of committing suicide just yet. Walter smiled grimly and helped himself. Waddington said nothing more. In fact, he became strangely taciturn, and soon after dinner he left them. It was true that they ate salad every night. Two days after their arrival, the cook, with the unconcern of the Chinese, had sent it in, and Kitty, without thinking, took some. Walter leaned forward quickly. You oughtn't to eat that. The boy's crazy to serve it. Why not? asked Kitty, looking at him full in the face. It's always dangerous. It's madness now. You'll kill yourself. I thought that was the idea, said Kitty. She began to eat it coolly. She was seized with she knew not what spirit of bravado. She watched Walter with mocking eyes. She thought that he grew a trifle pale, but when the salad was handed to him, he helped himself. The cook, finding they did not refuse it, sent them some in every day and every day, courting death. They ate it. It was grotesque to take such a risk. Kitty, in terror of the disease, took it with the feeling not only that she was thus maliciously avenging herself on Walter, but that she was flouting her own desperate fears. 38. It was the day after this that Waddington, coming to the bungalow in the afternoon, when he had sat a little, asked Kitty if she would not go for a stroll with him. She had not been out of the compound since her arrival. She was glad enough. There are not many walks, I'm afraid, he said, but we'll go to the top of the hill. Oh, yes, where the archway is. I've seen it often from the terrace. One of the boys opened the heavy doorway for them, and they stepped out into the dusty lane. They walked a few yards, and then Kitty, seizing Waddington's arm in fright, gave a startled cry. Look! What's the matter? At the foot of the wall that surrounded the compound, a man lay on his back, with his legs stretched out and his arms thrown over his head. He wore the patched blue rags and the wild mop of hair of the Chinese beggar. He looks as if he were dead, Kitty gasped. He is dead. Come along. You better look the other way. I'll have him moved when we come back. But Kitty was trembling so violently that she could not stir. I've never seen anyone dead before. You'd better hurry up and get used to it then, because you'll see a good many before you've done with this cheerful spot. He took her hand and drew it in his arm. They walked for a little in silence. Did he die of cholera? she said at last. I suppose so. They walked up the hill till they came to the archway. It was richly carved. Fantastic and ironical, it stood like a landmark in the surrounding country. They sat down on the pedestal and faced the wide plain. The hill was sown close with the little green mounds of the dead, not in lines but disorderly 
so that you felt that beneath the surface they must strangely jostle one another. The narrow causeway meandered sinuously among the green rice fields. A small boy seated on the neck of a water buffalo drove it slowly home, and three peasants in wide straw hats lolloped with sidelong gait under their heavy loads. After the heat of the day, it was pleasant in that spot to catch the faint breeze of the evening, and the wide expanse of country brought a sense of restful melancholy to the tortured heart. But Kitty could not rid her mind of the dead beggar. How can you talk and laugh and drink whiskey when people are dying all around you? she asked suddenly. Waddington did not answer. He turned round and looked at her. Then he put his hand on her arm. You know, this is no place for a woman, he said gravely. Why don't you go? She gave him a sidelong glance from beneath her long lashes, and there was the shadow of a smile on her lips. I should have thought under the circumstances a wife's place was by her husband's side. When they telegraphed to me that you were coming with Fane, I was astonished. But then it occurred to me that perhaps you'd been a nurse, and all this sort of thing was in the day's work. I expected you to be one of those grim-visaged females who lead you a dog's life when you're ill in hospital. You could have knocked me down with a feather when I came into the bungalow and saw you sitting down and resting. You looked very frail and white and tired. You couldn't expect me to look my best after nine days on the road. You look frail and white and tired now, and if you'll allow me to say so, desperately unhappy. Kitty flushed because she could not help it. But she was able to give a laugh that sounded merry enough. I'm sorry you don't like my expression. The only reason I have for looking unhappy is that since I was twelve, I've known that my nose was a little too long. But to cherish a secret sorrow is a most effective pose. You can't think how many sweet young men have wanted to console me. Waddington's blue and shining eyes rested on her, and she knew that he did not believe a word she said. She did not care so long as he pretended to. I knew that you hadn't been married very long, and I came to the conclusion that you and your husband were madly in love with each other. I couldn't believe that he had wished you to come, but perhaps you had absolutely refused to stay behind. That's a very reasonable explanation, she said lightly. Yes, but it isn't the right one. She waited for him to go on, fearful of what he was about to say, for she had a pretty good idea of his shrewdness and was aware that he never hesitated to speak his mind, but unable to resist the desire to hear him talk about herself. I don't think for a moment that you're in love with your husband. I think you dislike him. I shouldn't be surprised if you hated him. But I'm quite sure you're afraid of him. For a moment, she looked away. She did not mean to let Waddington see that anything he said affected her. I have a suspicion that you don't very much like my husband, she said with cool irony. I respect him. He has brains and character, and that, I may tell you, is a very unusual combination. I don't suppose you know what he is doing here, because I don't think he's very expansive with you. If any man single-handed can put a stop to this frightful epidemic, he's going to do it. He's doctoring the sick, cleaning the city up, trying to get the drinking water pure. He doesn't mind where he goes, nor what he does. He's risking his life twenty times a day. He's got Colonel Yu in his pocket, and he's induced him to put the troops at his disposal. He's even put a little pluck into the magistrate, and the old man is really trying to do something. And the nuns at the convent swear by him. They think he's a hero. Don't you? After all, this isn't his job, is it? He's a bacteriologist. There was no call for him to come here. He doesn't give me the impression that he's moved by compassion for all these dying Chinamen. Watson was different. He loved the human race. Though he was a missionary, it didn't make any difference to him if they were Christian, Buddhist, or Confucian. They were just human beings. Your husband isn't here because he cares a damn if a hundred thousand Chinese die of cholera. He isn't here either in the interests of science. Why is he here? You'd better ask him. It interests me to see you together. I sometimes wonder how you behave when you're alone. 
When I'm there, you're acting, both of you, and acting damned badly by George. You'd neither of you get thirty bob a week in a touring company if that's the best you can do. I don't know what you mean, smiled Kitty, keeping up a pretense of frivolity, which she knew did not deceive. You're a very pretty woman. It's funny that your husband should never look at you. When he speaks to you, it sounds as though it were not his voice, but somebody's else's. Do you think he doesn't love me? asked Kitty in a low voice, hoarsely, putting aside suddenly her lightness. I don't know. I don't know if you fill him with such a repulsion that it gives him goose flesh to be near you, or if he's burning with a love that for some reason he will not allow himself to show. I've asked myself if you're both here to commit suicide. Kitty had seen the startled glance, and then the scrutinizing look Waddington gave them when the incident of the salad took place. I think you're attaching too much importance to a few lettuce leaves, she said flippantly. She rose. Shall we go home? I'm sure you want a whiskey and soda. You're not a heroine at all events. You're frightened to death. Are you sure you don't want to go away? What has it got to do with you? I'll help you. Are you going to fall to my look of secret sorrow? Look at my profile and tell me if my nose isn't a trifle too long. He gazed at her reflectively, that malicious, ironical look in his bright eyes, but mingled with it, a shadow like a tree standing at a river's edge and its reflection in the water, was an expression of singular kindliness. It brought sudden tears to Kitty's eyes. Must you stay? Yes. They passed under the flamboyant archway and walked down the hill. When they came to the compound, they saw the body of the dead beggar. He took her arm, but she released herself. She stood still. It's dreadful, isn't it? What? Death? Yes. It makes everything else seem so horribly trivial. He doesn't look human. When you look at him, you can hardly persuade yourself that he's ever been alive. It's hard to think that not so very many years ago he was just a little boy tearing down the hill and flying a kite. She could not hold back the sob that choked her. 39. A few days later, Waddington, sitting with Kitty, a long glass of whiskey and soda in his hand, began to speak to her of the convent. The Mother Superior is a very remarkable woman, he said. The sisters tell me that she belongs to one of the greatest families in France, but they won't tell me which. The Mother Superior, they say, doesn't wish it to be talked of. Why don't you ask her if it interests you? smiled Kitty. If you knew her, you'd know it was impossible to ask her an indiscreet question. She must certainly be very remarkable if she can impress you with awe. I am the bearer of a message from her to you. She has asked me to say that, though of course you may not wish to adventure into the very centre of the epidemic, if you do not mind that it will give her great pleasure to show you the convent. It's very kind of her. I shouldn't have thought she was aware of my existence. I've spoken about you. I go there two or three times a week just now to see if there's anything I can do. And I dare say your husband has told them about you. You must be prepared to find that they have an unbounded admiration for him. Are you a Catholic? His malicious eyes twinkled and his funny little face was puckered with laughter. Why are you grinning at me? asked Kitty. Can any good come out of Galilee? No, I'm not a Catholic. I describe myself as a member of the Church of England, which, I suppose, is an inoffensive way of saying that you don't believe in anything very much. When the Mother Superior came here ten years ago, she brought seven nuns with her, and of those all but three are dead. You see, at the best of times, Meitan Fu is not a health resort. They live in the very middle of the city, in the poorest district, they work very hard, and they never have a holiday. But are there only three in the Mother Superior now? Oh no, more have taken their places. There are six of them now. When one of them died of cholera at the beginning of the epidemic, two others came up from Canton. Kitty shivered a little. Are you cold? No, it was only someone walking over my grave. 
When they leave France, they leave it forever. They're not like the Protestant missionaries who have a year's leave every now and then. I always think that must be the hardest thing of all. We English have no very strong attachment to the soil, we can make ourselves at home in any part of the world, but the French, I think, have an attachment to their country which is almost a physical bond. They're never really at ease when they're out of it. It always seems to me very moving that these women should make just that sacrifice. I suppose, if I were a Catholic, it would seem very natural to me. Kitty looked at him coolly. She could not quite understand the emotion with which the little man spoke, and she asked herself whether it was a pose. He had drunk a good deal of whiskey, and perhaps he was not quite sober. Come and see for yourself, he said, with his bantering smile, quickly reading her thought. It's not nearly so risky as eating a tomato. If you're not frightened, there's no reason why I should be. I think it'll amuse you. It's like a little bit of France. 40. They crossed the river in a sampan. A chair was waiting for Kitty at the landing stage, and she was carried up the hill to the water gate. It was through this that the coolies came to fetch water from the river, and they hurried to and fro with huge buckets hanging from the yoke on their shoulder, splashing the causeway so that it was as wet as though it had heavily rained. Kitty's bearers gave short, sharp cries to urge them to make way. Of course all business is at a standstill, said Waddington, walking by her side. Under normal circumstances you have to fight your way through the coolies, carrying loads up and down to the junks. The street was narrow and winding, so that Kitty lost all sense of the direction in which she was going. Many of the shops were closed. She had grown used on the journey up to the untidiness of a Chinese street, but here was the litter of weeks, garbage and refuse, and the stench was so horrible that she had to put her handkerchief to her face. Passing through Chinese cities, she had been incommoded by the staring of the crowd, but now she noticed that no more than an indifferent glance was thrown at her. The passers-by, scattered rather than as usual thronging, seemed intent on their own affairs. They were cowed and listless. Now and then, as they went by a house, they heard the beating of gongs and the shrill, sustained lament of unknown instruments. Behind those closed doors, one was lying dead. Here we are, said Waddington at last. The chair was set down at a small doorway, surmounted by a cross in a long white wall, and Kitty stepped out. He rang the bell. You mustn't expect anything very grand, you know. They're miserably poor. The door was opened by a Chinese girl, and after a word or two from Waddington, she led them into a little room on the side of the corridor. It contained a large table covered with a checkered oilcloth, and round the walls was a set of stiff chairs. At one end of the room was a statue in plaster of the Blessed Virgin. In a moment, a nun came in, short and plump, with a homely face, red cheeks, and merry eyes. Waddington, introducing Kitty to her, called her Sir St. Joseph. C'est la dame du docteur, she asked, beaming, and then added that the mother superior would join them directly. Sister St. Joseph could speak no English, and Kitty's French was halting, but Waddington, fluent, voluble, and inaccurate, maintained a stream of facetious comment which convulsed the good-humoured nun. Her cheerful, easy laughter not a little astonished Kitty. She had an idea that the religious were always grave, and this sweet and childlike merriment touched her. 41. The door opened, to Kitty's fancy not quite naturally, but as though it swung back of itself on its hinges, and the Mother Superior entered the little room. She stood for an instant on the threshold, and a grave smile hovered upon her lips as she looked at the laughing sister and Waddington's puckered, clownish face. Then she came forward and held out her hand to Kitty. Mrs. Fane? She spoke in English with a good deal of accent, 
but with a correct pronunciation, and she gave the shadow of a bow. It is a great pleasure to me to make the acquaintance of the wife of our good and brave doctor. Kitty felt that the superior's eyes held her in a long and unembarrassed look of appraisal. It was so frank that it was not uncivil. You felt that here was a woman whose business it was to form an opinion of others and to whom it never occurred that subterfuge was necessary. With a dignified affability, she motioned to her visitors to take chairs and herself sat down. Sister St. Joseph, smiling still but silent, stood at the side but a little behind the superior. I know you English like tea, said the mother superior, and I have ordered some, but I must make my excuses if it is served in the Chinese fashion. I know that Mr. Waddington prefers whiskey, but that I am afraid I cannot offer him. She smiled, and there was a hint of malice in her grave eyes. Oh, come, ma mère, you speak as if I were a confirmed drunkard. I wish you could say that you never drink, Mr. Waddington. I can at all events say that I never drink except to excess. The Mother Superior laughed and translated into French for Sister St. Joseph the flippant remark. She looked at him with lingering, friendly eyes. We must make allowances for Mr. Waddington, because two or three times when we had no money at all, and did not know how we were to feed our orphans, Mr. Waddington came to our rescue. The convert who had opened the door for them now came in with a tray on which were Chinese cups, a teapot, and a little plate of the French cakes called madeleines. You must eat the madeleines, said the Mother Superior, because Sister St. Joseph made them for you herself this morning. They talked of commonplace things. The Mother Superior asked Kitty how long she had been in China, and if the journey from Ching Yen had greatly tired her. She asked her if she had been in France, and if she did not find the climate of Ching Yen trying. It was a conversation, trivial but friendly, which gained a peculiar savour from the circumstances. The parlour was very quiet, so that you could hardly believe that you were in the midst of a populous city. Peace dwelt there, and yet all round about the epidemic was raging, and the people, terrified and restless, were kept in check, but by the strong will of a soldier who was more than half a brigand. Within the convent walls the infirmary was crowded with sick and dying soldiers, and of the orphans in the nuns' charge a quarter were dead. Kitty, impressed she hardly knew why, observed the grave lady who asked her these amiable questions. She was dressed in white, and the only colour on her habit was the red heart that burned on her breast. She was a woman of middle age. She might have been forty or fifty, it was impossible to say, for there were few wrinkles on her smooth, pale face, and you received the impression that she was far from young chiefly from the dignity of her bearing, her assurance, and the emaciation of her strong and beautiful hands. The face was long with a large mouth and large, even teeth. The nose, though not small, was delicate and sensitive, but it was the eyes under their thin black brows, which gave her face its intense and tragic character. They were very large, black, and though not exactly cold, by their calm steadiness strangely compelling. Your first thought when you looked at the Mother Superior was that as a girl she must have been beautiful, but in a moment you realized that this was a woman whose beauty, depending on character, had grown with advancing years. Her voice was deep, low and controlled, and whether she spoke in English or in French, she spoke slowly. But the most striking thing about her was the air she had of authority tempered by Christian charity. You felt in her the habit of command. To be obeyed was natural to her, but she accepted obedience with humility. You could not fail to see that she was deeply conscious of the authority of the church which upheld her. But Kitty had a surmise that notwithstanding her austere demeanour she had for human frailty a human tolerance, and it was impossible to look at her grave smile when she listened to Waddington, unabashed, talking nonsense, 
without being sure that she had a lively sense of the ridiculous. But there was some other quality in her which Kitty vaguely felt but could not put a name to. It was something that notwithstanding the mother superior's cordiality and the exquisite manners which made Kitty feel like an awkward schoolgirl, held her at a distance. 42. Monsieur ne mange rien, said Sister Saint Joseph. Monsieur's palate is ruined by Manchu cooking, replied the mother superior. The smile left Sister Saint Joseph's face, and she assumed an expression of some primness. Waddington, a roguish glance in his eyes, took another cake. Kitty did not understand the incident. To prove to you how unjust you are, ma mère, I will ruin the excellent dinner that awaits me. If Mrs. Fane would like to see over the convent, I shall be glad to show her. The Mother Superior turned to Kitty with a deprecating smile. I am sorry you should see it just now when everything is in disorder. We have so much work and not enough sisters to do it. Colonel Yu has insisted on our putting our infirmary at the disposal of six soldiers, and we have had to make the refectoire into an infirmary for our orphans. She stood at the door to allow Kitty to pass, and together, followed by Sister St. Joseph and Waddington, they walked along cool white corridors. They went first into a large, bare room, where a number of Chinese girls were working at elaborate embroideries. They stood up when the visitors entered, and the Mother Superior showed Kitty specimens of the work. We go on with it notwithstanding the epidemic, because it takes their minds off the danger. They went to a second room in which younger girls were doing plain sewing, hemming and stitching, and then into a third where there were only tiny children under the charge of a Chinese convert. They were playing noisily, and when the Mother Superior came in, they crowded round her, mites of two and three, with their black Chinese eyes and their black hair, and they seized her hands and hid themselves in her great skirts. An enchanting smile lit up her grave face, and she fondled them. She spoke little chaffing words, which Kitty, ignorant though she was of Chinese, could tell were like caresses. She shuddered a little, for in their uniform dress, sallow-skinned, stunted with their flat noses, they looked to her hardly human. They were repulsive. But the Mother Superior stood among them like charity itself. When she wished to leave the room, they would not let her go, but clung to her, so that, with smiling expostulations, she had to use a gentle force to free herself. They, at all events, found nothing terrifying in this great lady. You know, of course, she said, as they walked along another corridor, that they are only orphans in the sense that their parents have wished to be rid of them. We give them a few cash for every child that is brought in, otherwise they will not take the trouble, but do away with them. She turned to the sister. Have any come today? she asked. Four. Now with the cholera, they are more than ever anxious not to be burdened with useless girls. She showed Kitty the dormitories, and then they passed a door on which was painted the word infirmary. Kitty heard groans and loud cries and sounds as though beings not human were in pain. I will not show you the infirmary, said the Mother Superior in her placid tones. It is not a sight that one would wish to see. A thought struck her. I wonder if Dr. Fane is there. She looked interrogatively at the sister, and she, with her merry smile, opened the door and slipped in. Kitty shrank back as the open door allowed her to hear more horribly the tumult within. Sister St. Joseph came back. No, he has been and will not be back again till later. What about number six? Pauvre garçon, he's dead. The Mother Superior crossed herself, and her lips moved in a short and silent prayer. They passed by a courtyard, and Kitty's eyes fell upon two long shapes that lay side by side on the ground, covered with a piece of blue cotton. The Superior turned to Waddington. We are so short of beds 
that we have to put two patients in one, and the moment a sick man dies, he must be bundled out in order to make room for another. But she gave Kitty a smile. Now we will show you our chapel. We are very proud of it. One of our friends in France sent us a little while ago a life-size statue of the Blessed Virgin. 43. The chapel was no more than a long, low room with whitewashed walls and rows of deal benches. At the end was the altar on which stood the image. It was in plaster of Paris, painted in crude colours. It was very bright and new and garish. Behind it was a picture in oils of the crucifixion, with the two Maries at the foot of the cross, in extravagant attitudes of grief. The drawing was bad, and the dark pigments were put on with an eye that knew nothing of the beauty of colour. Around the walls were the stations of the cross, painted by the same unfortunate hand. The chapel was hideous and vulgar. The two nuns on entering knelt down to say a prayer, and then, rising, the Mother Superior began once more to chat with Kitty. Everything that can be broken is broken when it comes here, but the statue presented to us by our benefactor came from Paris without so much as the smallest chip. There is no doubt that it was a miracle. Waddington's malicious eyes gleamed, but he held his tongue. The altarpiece and the Stations of the Cross were painted by one of our sisters, Sir Saint Anselm. The Mother Superior crossed herself. She was a real artist. Unfortunately, she fell a victim to the epidemic. Do you not think that they are very beautiful? Kitty faltered an affirmative. On the altar were bunches of paper flowers, and the candlesticks were distractingly ornate. We have the privilege of keeping here the Blessed Sacrament. Yes, said Kitty, not understanding. It has been a great comfort to us during this time of so terrible trouble. They left the chapel and retraced their steps to the parlour in which they had first sat. Da Would you like to see the babies that came in this morning before you go? Very much, said Kitty. The Mother Superior led them into a tiny room on the other side of the passage. On a table, under a cloth, there was a singular wriggling. The sister drew back the cloth and displayed four tiny naked infants. They were very red, and they made funny, restless movements with their arms and legs. Their quaint little Chinese faces were screwed up into strange grimaces. They looked hardly human, queer animals of an unknown species, and yet there was something singularly moving in the sight. The Mother Superior looked at them with an amused smile. They seem very lively. Sometimes they are brought in only to die. Of course, we baptize them the moment they come. No, the lady's husband will be pleased with them, said Sister St. Joseph. I think he could play by the hour with the babies. When they cry, he has only to take them up, and he makes them comfortable in the crook of his arm, so that they laugh with delight. Then Kitty and Waddington found themselves at the door. Kitty gravely thanked the Mother Superior for the trouble she had taken. The nun bowed with a condescension that was at once dignified and affable. It has been a great pleasure. You do not know how kind and helpful your husband has been to us. He has been sent to us by heaven. I am glad that you came with him. When he goes home, it must be a great comfort to him to have you there with your love and your, your sweet face. You must take care of him and not let him work too hard. You must look after him for all our sakes. Kitty flushed. She did not know what to say. The Mother Superior held out her hand, and while she held it, Kitty was conscious of those cool, thoughtful eyes which rested on her with detachment, and yet with something that looked like a profound understanding. Sister St. Joseph closed the door behind them, and Kitty got into her chair. They went back through the narrow, winding streets. Waddington made a casual remark. Kitty did not answer. He looked round, but the side curtains of the chair were drawn, and he could not see her. He walked on in silence. But when they reached the river 
and she stepped out to his surprise, he saw that her eyes were streaming with tears. What is the matter? he asked, his face puckered into an expression of dismay. Nothing. She tried to smile. Only foolishness. Forty-four, alone once more, in the sordid parlour of the dead missionary, lying on the long chair that faced the window, her abstracted eyes on the temple across the river, now again at the approach of evening aerial and lovely, Kitty tried to set in order the feelings in her heart. She would never have believed that this visit to the convent could so have moved her. She had gone from curiosity. She had nothing else to do, and after looking for so many days at the walled city across the water, she was not unwilling to have at least a glimpse of its mysterious streets. But once within the convent, it had seemed to her that she was transported into another world situated strangely neither in space nor time. Those bare rooms and the white corridors, austere and simple, seemed to possess the spirit of something remote and mystical. The little chapel, so ugly and vulgar, in its very crudeness was pathetic. It had something which was wanting in the greatness of a cathedral, with its stained glass and its pictures. It was very humble, and the faith which had adorned it, the affection which cherished it, had endued it with the delicate beauty of the soul. The methodical way in which the convent's work was carried on in the midst of the pestilence showed a coolness in the face of danger and a practical sense, almost ironical. It was so matter-of-fact which were deeply impressive. In Kitty's ears rang still the ghastly sounds she heard when for a moment Sister St. Joseph opened the infirmary door. It was unexpected the way they had spoken of Walter. First, the sister, and then the mother superior herself, and the tone of her voice had been very gentle when she praised him. Oddly enough, it gave her a little thrill of pride to know that they thought so well of him. Waddington also had told something of what Walter was doing, but it was not only his competence that the nuns praised. In Ching Yen she had known that he was thought clever. They spoke of his thoughtfulness and his tenderness. Of course, he could be very tender. He was at his best when you were ill. He was too intelligent to exasperate, and his touch was pleasant, cool, and soothing. By some magic he seemed able by his mere presence to relieve your suffering. She knew that she would never see again in his eyes the look of affection which she had once been so used to that she found it merely exasperating. She knew now how immense was his capacity for loving. In some odd way, he was pouring it out on these wretched sick who had only him to look to. She did not feel jealousy but a sense of emptiness. It was as though a support that she had grown so accustomed to as not to realize its presence was suddenly withdrawn from her so that she swayed this way and that like a thing that was top-heavy. She had only contempt for herself because once she had felt contempt for Walter. He must have known how she regarded him, and he had accepted her estimate without bitterness. She was a fool, and he knew it, and because he loved her, it had made no difference to him. She did not hate him now, nor feel resentment of him, but fear, rather, and perplexity. She could not but admit that he had remarkable qualities. Sometimes she thought that there was even in him a strange and unattractive greatness. It was curious, then, that she couldn't love him, but loved still a man whose worthlessness was now so clear to her. After thinking, thinking all through those long days, she rated accurately Charles Townsend's value. He was a common fellow, and his qualities were second-rate. If she could only tear from her heart the love that still lingered there. She tried not to think of him. Waddington, too, thought highly of Walter. She alone had been blind to his merit. Why? Because he loved her, and she did not love him. What was it in the human heart that made you despise a man because he loved you? But Waddington had confessed that he did not like Walter. Men didn't. It was easy to see that those two nuns had for him a feeling which was very like affection. He was different with women. Notwithstanding his shyness, you felt in him an exquisite kindliness. 
Forty-five. But after all, it was the nuns that had most deeply touched her. Sister St. Joseph, with her merry face and apple-red cheeks, she had been one of the little band that came out to China with the Mother Superior ten years before, and she had seen one after another of her companions die of disease, privation, and homesickness. And yet she remained cheerful and happy. What was it that gave her that naive and charming humour and the Mother Superior? Kitty and Fancy stood again in her presence, and once more she felt humble and ashamed. Though she was so simple and unaffected, she had a native dignity which inspired awe, and you could not imagine that anyone could treat her without respect. Sister St. Joseph, by the way she stood, by every small gesture and the intonation of her answers, had shown the deep submission in which she held herself. And Waddington, frivolous and impertinent, had shown by his tone that he was not quite at his ease. Kitty thought it unnecessary to have told her that the Mother Superior belonged to one of the great families of France. There was that in her bearing which suggested ancient race, and she had the authority of one who has never known that it is possible to be disobeyed. She had the condescension of a great lady and the humility of a saint. There was in her strong, handsome, and ravaged face an austerity that was passionate, and at the same time she had a solicitude and a gentleness which permitted those little children to cluster, noisy and unafraid, in the assurance of her deep affection. When she had looked at the four newborn babies, she had worn a smile that was sweet and yet profound. It was like a ray of sunshine on a wild and desolate heath. What Sister St. Joseph had said so carelessly of Walter moved Kitty strangely. She knew that he had desperately wanted her to bear a child, but she had never suspected from his reticence that he was capable with a baby of showing, without embarrassment, a charming and playful tenderness. Most men were silly and awkward with babies. How strange he was! But to all that moving experience there had been a shadow, a dark lining to the silver cloud, insistent and plain, which disconcerted her. In the sober gaiety of Sister St. Joseph, and much more in the beautiful courtesy of the Mother Superior, she had felt an aloofness which oppressed her. They were friendly and even cordial, but at the same time they held something back, she knew not what, so that she was conscious that she was nothing but a casual stranger. There was a barrier between her and them. They spoke a different language not only of the tongue, but of the heart and when the door was closed upon her, she felt that they had put her out of their minds so completely, going about their neglected work again without delay, that for them she might never have existed. She felt shut out, not only from that poor little convent, but from some mysterious garden of the spirit, after which with all her soul she hankered. She felt on a sudden alone, as she had never felt alone before. That was why she had wept. And now, throwing back her head wearily, she sighed. Oh, I'm so worthless. 46. That evening Walter came back to the bungalow a little earlier than usual. Kitty was lying on the long chair by the open window. It was nearly dark. Don't you want a lamp? he asked. They'll bring it when dinner is ready. He talked to her always quite casually of trifling things, as though they were friendly acquaintances, and there was never anything in his manner to suggest that he harboured malice in his heart. He never met her eyes, and he never smiled. He was scrupulously polite. "'Walter, what do you propose we should do if we get through the epidemic?' she asked. He waited for a moment before answering. She could not see his face. "'I haven't thought—' In the old days she said carelessly whatever came into her head. It never occurred to her to think before she spoke. But now she was afraid of him. She felt her lips tremble, and her heart beat painfully. I went to the convent this afternoon. So I heard. She forced herself to speak, though she could hardly frame the words. Did you really want me to die when you brought me here? 
If I were you, I'd leave well alone, Kitty. I don't think any good will come of talking about what we should do much better to forget. But you don't forget. Neither do I. I've been thinking a great deal since I came here. Won't you listen to what I have to say? Certainly. I treated you very badly. I was unfaithful to you. He stood stock still. His immobility was strangely terrifying. I don't know whether you'll understand what I mean. That sort of thing doesn't mean very much to a woman when it's over. I think women have never quite understood the attitude that men take up. She spoke abruptly, in a voice she would hardly have recognized as her own. You know what Charlie was, and you knew what he'd do. Well, you were quite right. He's a worthless creature. I suppose I shouldn't have been taken in by him if I hadn't been as worthless as he. I don't ask you to forgive me. I don't ask you to love me as you used to love me. But couldn't we be friends? With all these people dying in thousands round us, and with those nuns in their convent. What have they got to do with it? he interrupted. I can't quite explain. I had such a singular feeling when I went there today. It all seems to mean so much. It's all so terrible, and their self-sacrifice is so wonderful. I can't help feeling it's absurd and disproportionate, if you understand what I mean, to distress yourself because a foolish woman has been unfaithful to you. I'm much too worthless and insignificant for you to give me a thought. He did not answer, but he did not move away. He seemed to be waiting for her to continue. Mr. Waddington and the nuns have told me such wonderful things about you. I'm very proud of you, Walter. You used not to be. You used to feel contempt for me. Don't you still? Don't you know that I'm afraid of you? Again he was silent. I don't understand you, he said at last. I don't know what it is you want. Nothing for myself. I only want you to be a little less unhappy. She felt him stiffen, and his voice was very cold when he answered. You're mistaken in thinking I'm unhappy. I have a great deal too much to do to think of you very often. I have wondered if the nuns would allow me to go and work at the convent. They are very short-handed, and if I could be of any help, I should be grateful to them. It is not easy work or pleasant work. I doubt if it would amuse you long. Do you absolutely despise me, Walter? No. He hesitated, and his voice was strange. I despise myself. 47. It was after dinner. As usual, Walter sat by the lamp and read. He read every evening till Kitty went to bed and then went into a laboratory which he had fitted up in one of the bungalow's empty rooms. Here he worked late into the night. He slept little. He was occupied with she knew not what experiments. He told her nothing of his work, but even in the old days he had been reticent on this. He was not by nature expansive. She thought deeply of what he had just said to her. The conversation had led to nothing. She knew him so little that she could not be sure if he was speaking the truth or not. Was it possible that, whereas he now existed so ominously for her, she had entirely ceased to exist for him? Her conversation which had entertained him once because he loved her, now that he loved her no longer might be merely tedious to him. It mortified her. She looked at him. The light of the lamp displayed his profile as though it were a cameo. With his regular and finely cut features it was very distinguished. But it was more than severe, it was grim. That immobility of his, only his eyes moving as he perused each page, was vaguely terrifying. Who would have thought that this hard face could be melted by passion to such a tenderness of expression? She knew, and it excited in her a little shiver of distaste. It was strange that though he was good-looking as well as honest, reliable, and talented, it had been so impossible for her to love him. It was a relief that she need never again submit to his caresses. No. He would not answer when she had asked him whether in forcing her to come here he had really wished to kill her. The mystery of this fascinated and horrified her. He was so extraordinarily kind. It was incredible that he could have had such a devilish intention. 
He must have suggested it only to frighten her, and to get back on Charlie, that would be like his sardonic humour. And then from obstinacy, or from fear of looking foolish, insisted on her going through with it. Yes, he said he despised himself. What did he mean by that? Once again, Kitty looked at his calm, cool face. She might not even be in the room. He was so unconscious of her. Why do you despise yourself? she asked, hardly knowing that she spoke, as though she were continuing without a break the earlier conversation. He put down his book and observed her reflectively. He seemed to gather his thoughts from a remote distance. Because I loved you. She flushed and looked away. She could not bear his cold, steady, and appraising gaze. She understood what he meant. It was a little while before she answered. I think you do me an injustice, she said. It's not fair to blame me, because I was silly and frivolous and vulgar. I was brought up like that. All the girls I know are like that. It's like reproaching someone who has no ear for music because he's bored at a symphony concert. Is it fair to blame me, because you ascribed to me qualities I hadn't got? I never tried to deceive you by pretending I was anything I wasn't. I was just pretty and gay. You don't ask for a pearl necklace or a sable coat at a booth in a fair. You ask for a tin trumpet and a toy balloon. I don't blame you. His voice was weary. She was beginning to feel a trifle impatient with him. Why could he not realize what suddenly had become so clear to her, that beside all the terror of death under whose shadow they lay, and beside the awe of the beauty which she had caught a glimpse of that day, their own affairs were trivial. What did it really matter if a silly woman had committed adultery, and why should her husband, face to face with the sublime, give it a thought? It was strange that Walter, with all his cleverness, should have so little sense of proportion, because he had dressed a doll in gorgeous robes and set her in a sanctuary to worship her, and then discovered that the doll was filled with sawdust, he could neither forgive himself nor her. His soul was lacerated. It was all make-believe that he had lived on, and when the truth shattered it, he thought reality itself was shattered. It was true enough he would not forgive her because he could not forgive himself. She thought that she heard him give a faint sigh, and she shot a rapid glance at him. A sudden thought struck her, and it took her breath away. She only just refrained from giving a cry. Was it what they called a broken heart that he suffered from? 48. All the next day Kitty thought of the convent, and the morning after, early, soon after Walter had gone, taking the armour with her to get chairs, she crossed the river. It was barely day, and the Chinese crowding the ferryboat, some in the blue cotton of the peasant, others in the black robes of respectability, had a strange look of the dead being borne over the water to the land of shadow. And when they stepped ashore, they stood for a little at the landing place, uncertainly, as though they did not quite know where to go, before desultorily, in twos and threes, they wandered up the hill. At that hour, the streets of the city were very empty, so that more than ever it seemed a city of the dead. The passers-by had an abstracted air, so that you might almost have thought them ghosts. The sky was unclouded, and the early sun shed a heavenly mildness on the scene. It was difficult to imagine, on that blithe, fresh and smiling morn, that the city lay gasping, like a man whose life is being throttled out of him by a maniac's hands, in the dark clutch of the pestilence. It was incredible that nature, the blue of the sky was clear like a child's heart, should be so indifferent when men were writhing in agony and going to their death in fear. When the chairs were set down at the convent door, a beggar arose from the ground and asked Kitty for alms. He was clad in faded and shapeless rags that looked as though he had raked them out of a muck heap, and through their rents you saw his skin hard and rough and tanned like the hide of a goat. His bare legs were emaciated, and his head, with its shock of coarse grey hair, the cheeks hollow, the eyes wild, 
was the head of a madman. Kitty turned from him in frightened horror, and the chair-bearers in gruff tones bade him begone, but he was importunate, and to be rid of him, shuddering, Kitty gave him a few cash. The door was opened, and the armor explained that Kitty wished to see the Mother Superior. She was taken once more into the stiff parlor in which it seemed a window had never been opened, and here she sat so long that she began to think her message had not been delivered. At last the Mother Superior came in. "'I must ask you to excuse me for keeping you waiting,' she said. "'I did not expect you and I was occupied. Forgive me for troubling you. I am afraid I have come at an inconvenient moment.' The Mother Superior gave her a smile, austere but sweet, and begged her to sit down. But Kitty saw that her eyes were swollen. She had been weeping. Kitty was startled, for she had received from the Mother Superior the impression that she was a woman whom earthly troubles could not greatly move. "'I'm afraid something has happened,' she faltered. "'Would you like me to go away? I can come another time.' "'No, no. Tell me what I can do for you. It is only, only that one of our sisters died last night. Her voice lost its even tone, and her eyes filled with tears. It is wicked of me to grieve, for I know that her good and simple soul has flown straight to heaven. She was a saint, but it is difficult always to control one's weakness. I'm afraid I'm not always very reasonable. I'm so sorry. I'm so dreadfully sorry, said Kitty. Her ready sympathy brought a sob into her voice. She was one of the sisters who came out from France with me ten years ago. There are only three of us left now. I remember. We stood in a little group at the end of the boat, what do you call it, the bow? And as we steamed out of the harbour at Marseille and we saw the golden figure of saint marie la grasse we said a prayer together. It had been my greatest wish since I entered religion to be allowed to come to China, but when I saw the land grow distant, I could not prevent myself from weeping. I was their superior. It was not a very good example I was giving my daughters. And then, Sister St. Francis Xavier, that is the name of the sister who died last night, took my hand and told me not to grieve. For wherever we were, she said, there was France, and there was God. That severe and handsome face was distorted by the grief which human nature wrung from her and by the effort to restrain the tears which her reason and her faith refused. Kitty looked away. She felt that it was indecent to peer into that struggle. I've been writing to her father. She, like me, was her mother's only daughter. They were fisher folk in Brittany, and it will be hard for them. Oh, when will this terrible epidemic cease? Two of our girls have been attacked this morning, and nothing but a miracle can save them. These Chinese have no resistance. The loss of Sister St. Francis is very severe. There is so much to do, and now fewer than ever to do it. We have sisters at our other houses in China who are eager to come. All our order, I think, would give anything in the world, only they have nothing, to come here. But it is almost certain death. And so long as we can manage with the sisters we have, I am unwilling that others should be sacrificed. That encourages me, ma mère, said Kitty. I have been feeling that I had come at a very unfortunate moment. You said the other day that there was more work than the sisters could do, and I was wondering if you would allow me to come and help them. I do not mind what I do if I can only be useful. I should be thankful if you just set me to scrub the floors. The Mother Superior gave an amused smile, and Kitty was astonished at the mobile temperament which could so easily pass from mood to mood. There is no need to scrub the floors. That is done after a fashion by the orphans. She paused and looked kindly at Kitty. My dear child, do you not think that you have done enough in coming with your husband here? That is more than many wives would have had the courage to do, and for the rest, how can you be better occupied than in giving him peace and comfort when he comes home to you after the day's work? Believe me, he needs then all your love and all your consideration. 
Kitty could not easily meet the eyes which rested on her with a detached scrutiny and with an ironical kindliness. And I have nothing whatever to do from morning till night, said Kitty. I feel that there is so much to be done that I cannot bear to think that I am idle. I don't want to make a nuisance of myself, and I know that I have no claim either on your kindness or on your time, but I mean what I say, and it would be a charity that you were doing me if you would let me be of some help to you. You do not look very strong. When you did us the pleasure of coming to see us the day before yesterday, it seemed to me that you were very pale. Sister St. Joseph thought that perhaps you were going to have a baby. No, no, cried Kitty, flushing to the roots of her hair. The Mother Superior gave a little silvery laugh. It is nothing to be ashamed of, my dear child, nor is there anything improbable in the supposition. How long have you been married? I am pale because I'm naturally pale, but I'm very strong. And I promise you, I am not afraid of work. Now the superior was complete mistress of herself. She assumed unconsciously the air of authority which was habitual to her, and she held Kitty in an appraising scrutiny. Kitty felt unaccountably nervous. Can you speak Chinese? I'm afraid not, answered Kitty. Ah, that is a pity. I could have put you in charge of the elder girls. It is very difficult just now, and I am afraid they will get, what do you call, out of hand, she concluded with a tentative sound. Could I not be of help to the sisters in nursing? I am not at all afraid of the cholera. I could nurse the girls or the soldiers. The mother superior, unsmiling now, a reflective look on her face, shook her head. You do not know what the cholera is. It is a dreadful thing to see. The work in the infirmary is done by soldiers, and we need a sister only to supervise. And so far as the girls are concerned, no, no, I am sure your husband would not wish it. It is a terrible and frightening sight. I should grow used to it. No, it is out of the question. It is our business and our privilege to do such things. But there is no call for you to do so. You make me feel very useless and very helpless. It seems incredible that there should be nothing that I can do. Have you spoken to your husband of your wish? Yes. The Mother Superior looked at her as though she were delving into the secrets of her heart, but when she saw Kitty's anxious and appealing look, she gave a smile. Of course you are a Protestant, she asked. Yes, it doesn't matter. Dr. Watson, the missionary who died, was a Protestant, and it made no difference. He was all that was most charming to us. We owe him a deep debt of gratitude. Now the flicker of a smile passed over Kitty's face, but she did not say anything. The Mother Superior seemed to reflect. She rose to her feet. It is very good of you. I think I can find something for you to do. It is true that now Sister St. Francis has been taken from us, it is impossible for us to cope with the work. When will you be ready to start? Now. A la bonne heure. I am content to hear you say that. I promise you, I will do my best. I am very grateful to you for the opportunity that you are giving me. The Mother Superior opened the parlour door, but as she was going out, she hesitated. Once more, she gave Kitty a long, searching and sagacious look. Then she laid her hand gently on her arm. You know, my dear child, that one cannot find peace in work or in pleasure, in the world or in a convent, but only in one's soul. Kitty gave a little start, but the Mother Superior passed swiftly out. 49. Kitty found the work a refreshment to her spirit. She went to the convent every morning soon after sunrise and did not return to the bungalow till the westering sun flooded the narrow river and its crowded junks with gold. The mother superior gave into her case the smaller children. Kitty's mother had brought to London from her native Liverpool a practical sense of housewifery, and Kitty, notwithstanding her air of frivolity, had always had certain gifts to which she referred only in bantering tones. 
Thus she could cook quite well, and she sewed beautifully. When she disclosed this talent, she was set to supervise the stitching and hemming of the younger girls. They knew a little French, and every day she picked up a few words of Chinese, so that it was not difficult for her to manage. At other times, she had to see that the smallest children did not get into mischief. She had to dress and undress them and take care that they rested when rest was needed. There were a good many babies, and these were in charge of amas, but she was bidden to keep an eye on them. None of the work was very important, and she would have liked to do something which was more arduous, but the mother superior paid no attention to her entreaties, and Kitty stood sufficiently in awe of her not to be importunate. For the first few days, she had to make something of an effort to overcome the faint distaste she felt for these little girls in their ugly uniforms, with their stiff black hair, their round, yellow faces, and their staring, slow black eyes. But she remembered the soft look which had transfigured so beautifully the countenance of the Mother Superior when on Kitty's first visit to the convent she had stood surrounded by those ugly little things, and she would not allow herself to surrender to her instinct. And presently, taking in her arms one or other of the tiny creatures, crying because of a fall or a cutting tooth, when Kitty found that a few soft words, though in a language the child could not understand, the pressure of her arms and the softness of her cheek against the weeping yellow face could comfort and console, she began to lose all her feeling of strangeness. The small children, without any fear of her, came to her in their childish troubles, and it gave her a peculiar happiness to discern their confidence. It was the same with the older girls, those to whom she taught sewing. Their bright, clever smiles and the pleasure she could give them by a word of praise touched her. She felt that they liked her, and flattered and proud, she liked them in return. But there was one child that she could not grow used to. It was a little girl of six, an idiot with a huge hydrocephalic head that swayed top-heavily on a small, squat body, large, vacant eyes, and a drooling mouth. The creature spoke hoarsely a few mumbled words. It was revolting and horrible and for some reason it conceived an idiot attachment for Kitty so that it followed her about as she changed her place from one part of the large room to another. It clung to her skirt and rubbed its face against her knees. It sought to fondle her hands. She shivered with disgust. She knew it yearned for caresses, and she could not bring herself to touch it. Once, speaking of it to Sister St. Joseph, she said that it was a pity it lived. Sister St. Joseph smiled and stretched out her hand to the misformed thing. It came and rubbed its bulging forehead against it. Poor little mite, said the nun. She was brought here positively dying. By the mercy of Providence I was at the door just as she came. I thought there was not a moment to lose, so I baptized her at once. You would not believe what trouble we have had to keep her with us. Three or four times we thought— that her little soul would escape to heaven. Kitty was silent. Sister St. Joseph, in her loquacious way, began to gossip of other things, and next day when the idiot child came to her and touched her hand, Kitty nerved herself to place it in a caress on the great bare skull. She forced her lips into a smile. But suddenly the child, with an idiot perversity, left her, it seemed to lose interest in her, and that day and the following days paid her no attention. Kitty did not know what she had done, and tried to lure it to her with smiles and gestures, but it turned away and pretended not to see her.